For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of God Most High, met Abraham and blessed him as he returned from defeating the kings. And Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. First, his name means king of righteousness, then also king of Salem, meaning king of peace. Without father, mother, or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God, he remains a priest forever. Now consider how great this man was. Even Abraham the patriarch gave a tenth of the plunder to him. The sons of Levi who receive the priestly office have a command according to the law to collect a tenth from the people. That is, from their brothers and sisters, though they have also descended from Abraham. But one without this lineage collected a tenth from Abraham and blessed the one who had the promises. Without a doubt, the inferior is blessed by the superior. In the one case, men who will die receive a tenth. But in the other case, scripture testifies that he lives. In a sense, Levi himself, who receives a tenth, has paid a tenth through Abraham. For he was still within his ancestor when Melchizedek met him. Good morning, Shannon family. If you have your Bible, and I hope that you do, I invite you to open it with me to the book of Hebrews chapter 7, the book of Hebrews chapter 7. And this morning, I want to speak to you on the subject, a mother's ultimate ministry representing God before her children. If you're thinking, I cannot remember the last time that I heard a Mother's Day message from Hebrews 7, you're probably right. I can't either. But I believe there are two reasons that we need to stay in the book of Hebrews this morning. First, we, believing, we believe in preaching the entire counsel of God here at Shannon Baptist Church. It takes the entire Bible to build up an entire Christian. If our goal was to entertain you, we might have a light show or a concert. I would get up and do stand-up comedy for 20 minutes, but the result would be that you might leave happy, but certainly hungry. It is our goal here not to give you a cotton candy diet of preaching, but rather to give you true sustenance from the Word of God. Preaching that feeds the soul says what the Bible says the way the Bible says it. It's the Word of God that feeds your soul, not TED Talks, not entertainment, not stand-up comedy. It's the Word of God that feeds your soul. The Bible is the voice of God in the church, and it is our goal to amplify God's Word. Amen? But also, we believe that Scripture has one meaning, but many applications. Now, let me be very clear. Hebrews 7 is all about Jesus. It's not about mothers per se. It's about the priesthood of Jesus. But just as Jesus in his threefold ministry of prophet, priest, and king represents God before men and men before God, a mother represents God before her children. A mother under the lordship of Jesus Christ represents God before her family. So a mom and a dad is a representation of sorts to their families. And so today we're going to look at God's word and to see what this says to us about Jesus, but also what it says to us on this Mother's Day. I'm going to begin reading here in verse 1 of chapter 7, but also we'll look at verse 14 through 17. The Bible says, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of God Most High, met Abraham and blessed him as he returned from defeating the kings. And Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. First, his name means king of righteousness, then also king of Salem, meaning king of peace. Without father, mother, or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God, he remains a priest forever. Now consider how great this man was. Even Abraham, the patriarch, gave a tenth of the plunder to him. The sons of Levi, who received the priestly office, have a command, according to the law, to collect a tenth from the people, that is, from their brothers and sisters, though they have also descended from Abraham. But one without this lineage collected a tenth from Abraham and blessed the one who had the promises. Without a doubt, the inferior is blessed by the superior. And in one case, men who will die receive a tenth, but in the other case, Scripture testifies that he lives. And in a sense, Levi himself, who receives a tenth, 
has paid a tent through Abraham, for he was still within his ancestor when Melchizedek met him. Verse 14. Now it is evident that our Lord came from Judah, and Moses said nothing about that tribe concerning priest. And this becomes clear if another priest like Melchizedek appears, who did not become a priest based on a legal regulation about physical descent, but based on the power of an indestructible life. For it has been testified, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. I love a good movie and a novel. I imagine that you do as well. There's one thing that I've learned about successful movies. Whenever they are successful, there's another one that follows it. We call that a sequel. There's an add-on, if you will, that you take the first story and you build upon it. Film producers will do this and also novelists. So take, for example, Home Alone 1. It was so successful that they created a sequel, which is Home Alone 2, adding on to the original story. But there are some film producers and novelists that they don't work forwards, instead they work backwards. They write a story or produce a film, not based on what is to be said, but what has occurred beforehand. Now, this is a sequel, but to be more precise, this is a prequel. It gives you the backstory, which leads up to the story itself. Now, this is important because for you and me, when we came to Christ, we came to him with all the simplicity that we knew, that we received Jesus by faith, and we were changed. Grace came into our life and, and, and God began to transform us and we didn't know all the details. We were learning more and more. Now, to be clear, that was all the, the grace that we needed. But looking backwards now, that we see a fuller picture of the knowledge of truth. So if you would, that was the main story. But as we started growing in our relationship with the Lord, we learned the backstory, which is the Old Testament. Now all of this fits together. Now, for those to whom the author of Hebrews is writing, they already knew the backstory. They lived the prequel. They lived in a day where there was a Levitical system and sacrificial systems where they sacrificed bulls and goats and rams. That was part of their culture. But we don't have that luxury here in the West. For those of us who are Christians here in the 21st century, we need to look backwards and understand the prequel in order for us to understand the main idea. Now, the book of Hebrews, specifically Hebrews 7, is a very complicated passage, but I wanna simplify it for you from the beginning. Uh, Hebrews 7 is saying this, Jesus is better because he is eternal and superior. That's the main idea of Hebrews chapter seven. Jesus is better, he's greater, because he is eternal and he is superior. But for us to understand the complexities of this argument, we need to understand the prequel. And I wanna give you four foundations that leads up to the prequel. First of all, you have to understand the situation. Those to whom the author is, is writing, there's the temptation to backslide. So he's writing to Jewish Christians who are living in Rome. They are the persecuted church. They are being persecuted because of their faith. Now Hebrews 10, we'll talk about this in more detail. They lost their home, their properties, relationships, and some were even martyred because of their faith. They were persecuted by the Roman government, but also by their own families. Many of their families would disown them as they were on their way to the temple to offer sacrifices. And I'm sure that those to whom the author of Hebrews is writing, they're thinking, is Jesus worth it? Is Jesus truly the Messiah? Have I made a mistake? Have I done something that's wrong? And there is the temptation to backslide, to renounce Christ, to revert back to Judaism, and to deny the faith. Now listen very carefully. The temptation that you face in life may not be to fall back into Judaism, but every Christian faces certain temptations. It's one sin at a time. 
one decision at a time, one compromise at a time. Spiritual death occurs one compromise at a time, one compromise here, another compromise there, and then we begin looking like the world. It should be of great concern to us when we see the wickedness of the world, but it should also be of great concern to us when we see the compromise of a Christian. The swift wind of compromise from a Christian is often more devastating than the slow fade of indifference from society. It can happen to anyone. It can happen to you. You can backslide. We don't use that word very often today, but it's a true term. It can happen to you. And that was the situation to which the author of Hebrews is writing. But also we see in this passage, there are four characters. The first character is Melchizedek. Now, Melchizedek is this shadowy figure who points us to Christ. He's a type of Christ. We've learned about Melchizedek. Remember there in chapter five, the author was gonna talk to us about Melchizedek, but he says, I can't do that. You're spiritually indifferent. You're lazy. He says, it's time to grow up. He says, leave the elementary and press forward to maturity. And over the last four weeks, we've been talking about what it means to press forward spiritually. So there's Melchizedek, but there's also Aaron. Aaron is a representative of the Levitical high priest and the temple system. So if you were a priest in the Old Testament, you had to come from the tribe of Levi. That was the only tribe that the priest came from. In fact, if you didn't like the priest in that day, you just had to wait them out. They could only serve for 25 years and there would be a new priest that would come onto the scene. So there's Aaron, who's a representative of the Levitical system. There's also Abraham. You know, Father Abraham, who had many sons, the song that we sing, we've got Abraham. And that points us back to Genesis 14. But then there is Jesus. Four characteristics that we see here in this passage. But also, there are two texts. There are two scripture passages that we see. One, which is Psalm 110, where it says that my Lord said to to my Lord, sit at the right hand until I make an enemy's a footstool for you. But also, Genesis 14. We're gonna come back to Genesis 14. But then there is one main idea. There's one main theme, and it's about the priesthood of Jesus. So this really complicated passage that really can be summarized like this. The question is, is Jesus's priesthood better, or is the Levitical priesthood better? That's what's being asked in verses 1 through 10. Then in verses 11 through 18, the author says, Well, the Levitical priesthood is inferior. Therefore, you have to go with option B. So not option A, but option B. Therefore, Jesus' priesthood is superior. So that's the main idea of the passage today. Do not backslide. Do not revert back. Why is that? Because Jesus' priesthood is better. Now, in order to get us there, the author of Hebrews is going to push us back to the Old Testament, he's going to show us two Old Testament characters, both Abraham and Levi, and he's gonna tell us there's someone named Melchizedek who's greater than them both, and Melchizedek is a type of Christ. So here's what I wanna do this morning. I wanna give you the prequel, which is back in the Old Testament. I wanna give you the main story, and then we're gonna look at the sequel as well. So in order for us to get what I would call the prequel, you've gotta go to Genesis chapter 14. Now, you don't have to turn there right now, but Genesis chapter 14, here's what's taking place. You have Abraham and his nephew Lot has been taken by kings. So he goes and he goes to redeem, to protect Lot, who's become a prisoner of war. Now, Abraham did this because he was obligated to do so. He was known as the kinsman redeemer. The Hebrew word is goel. The idea is that he would redeem them and that he would protect his kinsmen. Do you remember in the book of Job when Job says, I know that my redeemer lives. And then I have to look at the book of Ruth and even in the New Testament where we learn that Jesus, he is our ultimate kinsman redeemer. So Abraham goes to protect Lot. And after he wins this battle between the kings, off in the distance, you have the king of Sodom that's coming to negotiate with him. But then off in the distance as well, there's this shadowy figure named Melchizedek. And Melchizedek comes 
to do two things. Now, here's what the author is telling us. Melchizedek is greater than Abraham. How do we know that? Two reasons. Number one, Abraham paid a tithe to Melchizedek. But second, Melchizedek blessed Abraham. So first of all, there's a tithe that's paid by Abraham. Someone asked me recently, they said, Pastor, do you get uncomfortable when talking about tithing, when you talk about giving unto the Lord? Does that make you uncomfortable when you talk about money in church? And I said, absolutely not, because God owns it all. God not only owns the cattle on a thousand hills, but God owns the hills as well. Uh, Does God need us or does God need our money as as if God is poor and he's saying, hey, I need you to give back to me? That's not it at all. God wants us to give not for what God can get out of it, but for what we can get out of it. Does the Bible not say that where your treasure is, there your heart will be also, when, you're, when you open your hand in generosity to God, God begins to open your heart. Now, I've heard, had people to tell me, they've said, well, tithing, that's an Old Testament principle. We're now under the age of grace. We're just to give generously, but not so fast. Does the Bible not tell us that Melchizedek, he preceded the giving of the law? Melchizedek, he gave a tenth before the Old Testament law was instituted. Listen, tithing is not an Old Testament principle. Tithing is a biblical principle because God wants you to give so that your heart can be open to him. So Abraham, he gives a tenth. But also, Melchizedek, blesses Abraham. Now that's important because look here at verse seven. It says, without a doubt, the inferior is blessed by the superior. Now, if you were a Jew, you held Abraham in the highest regards. Do you remember there in John chapter eight where Jesus is talking to the Pharisees and he says, who is your father? And they said, Abraham is our father. And he said, no, your father is the devil. Now, the reason the Pharisees said that is because they were connecting their closeness to God based on Abraham, not on a relationship with the Lord. They said, oh, if we know Abraham, then we're good. That's how many people are today. They view their closeness to to God based on religious proximity, not by a relationship with Jesus. Or if I could put it this way, you can be close to religion in proximity and be far from Jesus personally. Just because you come to church doesn't mean that you're close to God. Just because you go to a Sunday school class or a small group, or there was a day when you signed a card or that you prayed a prayer. What makes someone right with God is faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and the provision that's taken place on the cross. There's no blood like Jesus' blood. There's no sacrifice like Jesus' sacrifice. Listen, don't trust in your own abilities. Don't trust in just your own intuition. The only reason that you are right with God is because what Jesus has done on on the cross. The cross redrew the lines of human history. Billy Graham used to say that one of the greatest mission fields in our churches in the world today is our churches. People that they think that because they attend church or because that they show up in a small group that they're right with God. What makes you right with God is the work of God that's taking place in Christ and receiving him into your life. And so he says two reasons while Melchizedek is greater than Abraham. But then he shifts and he says, but Melchizedek is also greater than Levi. Now in the Old Testament, you could be a priest for 25 years, from age 25 to age 50, for 25 years. But eventually you would go off the scene. Also in the Old Testament, if you were to be a priest, you had to come from the tribe of Levi, not the tribe of Dan, not the tribe of Judah. You had to come from the tribe of Levi. Now, the reason that Melchizedek is greater is that we don't know Melchizedek's genealogy. Uh, We know that Aaron comes from the tribe of Levi, but Melchizedek, it says he has no beginning or no end. So these two ideas, Melchizedek is greater than Abraham and Levi, which ultimately point us to Jesus because Jesus is likened to Melchizedek. So prequel, You get the picture from the past, but here's the main idea that the author tells us. He says, Jesus is better 
because like Melchizedek, he is eternal and superior. In the Old Testament, there was a separation of powers. A king could not be a priest, and a king needed a prophet. But in Jesus, Jesus becomes all three, prophet, priest, and king. Now, a prophet, he represented man to God. A priest represented God to man. And a king, he ruled. The prophet, he dealt with revelation. The king dealt with ruling, and the priest dealt with redemption. But in Jesus, all three come together. Now, in the Old Testament, the only person, this is pivotal to understanding here, the only person who served as both a priest and a king was Melchizedek. There was someone else who tried, that was Uzziah. Do you remember there in Isaiah 6, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. Uzziah was a good king that he ruled for four decades, for 40 plus years. But at the end of his life, he made a terrible mistake. Uzziah, he tried to usurp the Lord and he became, tried to be both a priest and a king. And because of that, that he developed leprosy and that he was then pushed off into the scenes. Remember that story, it goes on to say that Isaiah saw the Lord and he said, holy, holy, holy. Now, this is a rabbit trail that I'm gonna run for just a moment. But in the Old Testament, that's the only time that you see to the third power a characteristic that is attributed to God. Notice that it didn't say love, 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 or joy, 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 or peace, peace, peace. Could have said that, but the very foundational characteristic of who God is, it says, holy, holy, holy. We have a holy God who is a good God. So what he's saying here is that Uzziah, he tried to be both a priest and a king, but the only one in the Old Testament who is both a king and a priest was Melchizedek, and Melchizedek points us to Jesus. Now, there are two things about Melchizedek that we see here in the passage. First of all, that he was eternal in the sense that we don't have the genealogy, but also Melchizedek was superior to Abraham and Levi. And what he's saying is this, Jesus is better because he is eternal and Jesus is better because he is superior. Jesus, he is more than a good man. He's more than an outstanding teacher. Jesus is more than a leadership guru. Jesus is God. The Bible says that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus is God. He lived the life that we could not live. He died the death that we deserve to die. He absorbed the wrath of God on our place. And by rising from the dead on the third day, he proved to us that Jesus is God. And because of that, he's eternal. Now, that's why, this is why that's important. Everything that is over your head today is under God's feet. Every problem that you experience today, every difficulty, every challenge, it may be over your head, but it's under God's feet because Jesus is eternal. Not only is he eternal, Jesus is also superior as our great high priest. In the book of Hebrews, we've been learning that Jesus is better Jesus is better than any sin, addiction, challenge, or difficulty that we may be going through. Jesus is simply better. There's no problem today that you're experiencing that Jesus can't solve. There's no challenge that you're going through that couldn't be resolved uh, through prayer and God's work uh, involved in your life. Jesus is simply better because he's superior, the supremacy and superiority of Jesus. Now, that's the main idea. It's a prequel main story, but now the sequel. Remember that I told you that a priest, the role of the priest was to represent men to God and God to men. And just as Jesus in his threefold office of prophet, priest, and king represents men to God and God to men, mothers are to represent God before her children. There's a phrase in our culture today, keeping up with the Joneses. Moms and dads, your children don't need you to keep up with the Joneses. They need you to walk with Jesus. 
Walking with Jesus is what is most important. And I believe that in this passage, we see at least three ways that mothers, but also families can represent God before their children and grandchildren. First of all, you represent God to your kids in the way you protect them from Satan's traps. There in Genesis chapter 14, Abraham, as the kinsman redeemer, he goes to protect Lot and goes to redeem him. In the same way, that's how we are to protect our children. The Bible says in 1 Peter 5 that your adversary, Satan, he prowls around like a lion seeking to devour those whom he may. Satan has set traps of deception before our children, but it is our job as parents to protect them from the godless ideologies that are being disseminated today in our culture. Our culture would say that our kids are a random collection of molecules held in suspension, that they are the result of a big bang, a cosmic accident. But the Bible teaches us that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and behold, it is very good. You are created by a God that loves you. Our culture today would say that gender is fluid, that gender is self-determining. But the Bible would say that he created them male and female. It's our job as parents it, to push off the godless ideologies of the day and say that God's way is better. Our children are being told today that they don't matter. But the Bible would say that they are fearfully and wonderfully made. They are made in the very image of God. And we as parents are to rise up and push back against the darkness of our society and say that God's way is better. Amen. You also represent God to your kids in the way that you teach them that Jesus is eternal. And we teach them that Jesus is eternal in at least two ways. Number one, through lordship. Number two, through generosity. You say, what does lordship mean? As someone has said, either Jesus is Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. Lordship means control, that you've been marked under new management that God is the one that, lead, that is leading you and directing you. God is in control. Parents, you can't take your children to a place that you haven't gone yourself. You can't disciple your kids if you are not following after the Lord and being discipled. It begins with lordship. When you ignore the authority of submission in the heart, you're also ignoring the theology of lordship in the home, or if I could put it this way, a child who learns to say yes ma'am and yes sir at the age of five is being trained to say yes Lord at the age of 15. We wanna teach our children that they are under the authority of Jesus and Jesus' way is better. Jesus has better plans for them. So we teach them lordship, the eternity of Christ, but also we teach them generosity. I've heard this statement, you probably have too. We say it all the time in America. Whoever dies with the most toys wins. But that's false because the gospel says whoever dies with Jesus wins. And there are those who think that if I just make a lot of money, that if I just pursue materialism, that I will be happy. No, you will not be happy, but by your holiness in pursuing Jesus, that's how you become happy is first through holiness. I've also heard this statement. There are those who would say that if you are going to be any worldly good, you can't be heavenly minded. That's ridiculous. Those who do the most in this present world are those who think the most of the world to come. There are three things that are eternal. God himself, God's word, and the souls of men. Don't live for today. Don't live for the temporary. Instead, you live for the eternal. You live for the Lord. We want to teach our children. We represent God to our children by teaching them that God is eternal. But also, you represent God to your kids in the way you show them that Jesus is superior. Do you really believe that, that Jesus is superior? Now, the exchange in parenting is, is challenging because the closer that your kids get to you, the more imperfections that they see. It's easy to look good from a distance, 
but it's as you come into close proximity that you see someone for who they truly are. And you can fool someone from a distance, but spiritual maturity can only be discerned in close proximity. It's in close quarters. That's where you truly learn what someone is like. Now, kids today, they're not looking for perfection. Only Jesus is perfect. But they're looking for us to be real. When we make mistakes, for us to apologize, for us to be humble, for us to be real, and to show our children that Jesus is truly superior. In the way that we live our lives, are we showing our children that Jesus is better than anything this world has to offer? You can have all this world, but give me Jesus. So Hebrews chapter seven, this one big idea. Jesus is better. Don't backslide. Because Jesus is better because he's eternal and also he's superior. Because he's a great high priest. And just as a great high priest represents men to God and God to men, we as parents are to represent God before our children. Just this past weekend, I had the opportunity to go on base at Fort Jackson. One of the benefits of being your pastor is we have several chaplains who serve within our congregation at Fort Jackson. So I was able to ride around Fort Jackson to go into a few buildings and um, to, to see some of the sites. I went into one of the buildings and there's a story that many of you might know pretty well. I asked the person that I was with, I said, hey, tell me about the story of, of the stained glass window there. And they said, well, it goes back to February the 3rd, 1943. The USAT Dorchester, you had 902 servicemen. They were traveling from Newfoundland to, to Greenland when there was a German submarine. The German submarine spotted them and then launched a torpedo. It capsized the ship, and it was just a matter of time before they would capsize. There was a frantic response on deck, but there were four chaplains, Chaplain Fox, Good, Washington, and Poling, they began to sing songs and to comfort the soldiers, representing God before men. But not only that, they knew that other soldiers wouldn't have time to go to the bottom of the vessel. So they took their life jacket and they gave it to the other soldiers. And there the four chaplains, they passed away in the frigid sea because they gave their rescue, their life for someone else. Now, come in closely this morning. Satan, what he wants to do is torpedo us by sin. And when the torpedo of sin was launched towards mankind, Jesus is our great high priest who is superior and eternal. That he took the life jacket, he took the boat, and, and, and he put it on us so that we wouldn't be submerged in our sin forever, but instead that we could be rescued. Why is Jesus superior? Why is Jesus eternal? Because he did what could not be done for us otherwise, that he came in our place when the torpedo of sin came our way. Jesus says, I've got a rescue plan for you and I am coming for you and Jesus died for us. That is why Jesus is superior. So Hebrews chapter seven, prequel. Melchizedek as a type, he is greater than Abraham and Levi. But Jesus, this ultimate picture, Jesus, who like Melchizedek, he is eternal and superior. And because of that, as the apostle Paul would say, follow me as I follow Christ, as we are being led by Jesus, who is our high priest, representing man to God and God to men, we represent God before our families by protecting them and by teaching them and showing them that Jesus is superior and eternal. Jesus is enough. Now, if every head would be bowed at this time and every eye closed as we move into a time of response, I believe that there's somebody here today who needs to respond to the Lord. Maybe you need to respond in salvation. You've, you've never been saved and you realize that the torpedo of sin has coming towards your life, shipwrecking you spiritually. And today you want to receive Jesus, the life jacket, the rescue boat to save you. 
Or maybe today you wanna come forward as a family, you wanna pray for your children as this world tries to continue to put godless ideologies in their minds and hearts, that you would pray for their protection. As we have said several weeks ago, Genesis chapter three, perfect environment, Garden of Eden, perfect Father God and Adam and Eve rebelled. You can do everything right and this world pulls hard. But maybe today you wanna come forward and you wanna pray for your family. Pray God's protection over them. Pray for that prodigal child, that grandchild, that person in your family. Would you come today? Maybe you need to come forward and express your intent to be baptized or to join the Shannon Baptist family. We welcome you. But Jesus is superior. Jesus is superior eternal. And because of that, don't backslide. Instead, come to him. Jesus is enough. Father in heaven, we pray now that as we respond to you, Lord, we pray for the protection of our families. Lord, we pray for the protection of their souls. Lord, we pray for the person who's far from you. Lord, as it tells us in the book of Jude to snatch them out of the fire. Lord, I pray that you might put people in their path, Lord, that would rescue them from the traps that have been set before them by Satan. God, how we pray for our families that we would represent God before them because Jesus is better. So Lord, we pray during this response time that you would have your way among us. Lord, as our staff is down front here. Lord, I pray that people would come into the arms of Jesus, responding to him. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.